All right, hello everybody, good morning. Uh, in today's lecture, we're not going to cover a metabolic pathway. Um, we will look at uh, a group of specialized tissues which make use of all the ATP, which is produced in all the catabolic pathways that you've seen already. So what would be the main catabolic pathways to produce uh, ATP? I mean, indirectly or directly? What would be the main metabolic pathways that give us, give ourselves ATP? Sure, electron transport chain, which is the final pathway where, where all the other metabolic pathways converge. Yeah, and the pathways that converge would be glycolysis, absolutely. Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle. Beta oxidation. Okay, so those would be the main pathways that end up producing quite a lot of ATP. So today we will look at muscle tissue. Uh, and we will specifically look at the mechanisms, molecular mechanisms, through which all this ATP, all this chemical potential energy, which is stored in the ratio of ATP to ADP, just to, to review, uh, when we talked about um, thermodynamics, we said that the thing that determines if we can do some work from some chemical reaction is how far from equilibrium, from the equilibrium it is, right? So ATP, ADP is very, very far. It's kept through the pathways that we just mentioned, electron transport chain, and all the pathways that feed into the electron transport chain is kept far away from the equilibrium, and that's why we can use it to do work. And in the case of muscle tissue, the work that we do is actual mechanical work, moving things from place to place or holding them against gravity in place, okay? So we will look at all the different molecular mechanisms and structures that allow this. And towards the end of the lecture, uh, we will look at a little bit how or which of the metabolic pathways are actually used in the different types of muscle. So what nutrients are prefer preferentially used in different situations. But this part of muscle physiology, we will cover in a lot more detail in the second year. Okay, so the stuff about nutrients and how they're used and growth of muscle, etc., will be covered next year. All right, so that's the plan for today. And we will start just by briefly, well, waking you up, I was going to say, but I think you've already had some stuff before. Um, so maybe waking me up. Um, when we talk about muscle tissue, there are different kinds of muscle tissue that we find in a human body. What are they? Uh, okay, so there's cardiac muscle, the smooth muscle, and skeletal muscle. Um, what are the similarities or differences, or can we group them, these three types of muscle, some? Cardiac and skeletal are striated. Correct, and what does it mean that they are striated muscle? They have sarcomeres. Okay, so we can see, using a microscope, we can see sarcomeres. We'll get to that in a second. So we have three different kinds of muscle, and they do differ, as we'll see in a second. They, I mean, you've already seen that they differ structurally. So sarcomeres, the presence or the absence of sarcomeres is one thing in which they differ, but they do differ structurally. They differ in different ways as well. So what other things are different between these three types of muscle? Because you've covered that already. So this is just to... Oxidative metabolism. What about it? Okay, and the other muscles? They can be aerobic or anaerobic. Okay, so we'll, we'll cover that towards the end of the lecture, okay, and we'll see that all of them can use oxidative metabolism, only in very specific situations they might not, or some of them, okay? But yes, there are definitely differences in the, in the use of substrates and the substrate metabolism. But structurally speaking, what other differences are there apart from the presence or absence of sarcomeres in the, or the presence in the striated muscle and the absence in smooth muscle? Type of cells, okay. What about it? Like, uh, the striated is kind of no longer and multinucleated, and the smooth muscle is like, kind of thin and only one of those. Okay, okay. Can somebody add something? So, in, with smooth muscle, definitely we have single cells with a single nucleus. Absolutely, yeah, I agree with that. How does it work with the two subtypes of striated muscle? Uh, both cardiac and, and skeletal muscle? 
Okay, okay, all right. So skeletal muscle has these very long fibers, multinucleated, which are formed by fusion of kind of pre-muscle cells called myoblasts, yeah, okay. So yeah, so we have very long fibers, actually as long as, as the muscle, okay, so very, very long, many nuclei, complicated internal structure with, as we'll, as we'll see in a second. All right, so that's for skeletal muscle. And what about cardiac muscle? How does it work there, structurally? That is true, but uh, but now I'm asking about structural difference between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscles contain intercalated discs. That is that is true, and what, what are why do they have intercalated discs, or what are they? They are. Huh? They are branched. Okay, you're saying a lot of things. Okay, let's put it all together. Okay, so we said that skeletal muscle, very long fibers, many nuclei. Okay, how does it work with, with cardiac muscle? And also very long fibers, multinucleated. Up to two nucleus. Up to two nucleus. Okay, so they're not multinucleated. They may have one or two nuclei. Okay, they are quite a bit shorter. Okay, they can be branched. Who said that they, they can be branched? Absolutely. And they are connected by means of the connecting things between cardiomyocytes? Mm, not really. They're called intercalated discs, okay? So those are the connections, and they contain, among other things, these intercalated discs contain, they contain tight junctions to hold the two cells together, and they also contain gap junctions, whose function is? Communication. Yes, communication more specifically. Yes, synchronizing the, yeah, the, the flow of signal by means of what do they allow to go through? Of ions, yeah. They allow the transport also other things, but transport of ions, which is the means through which the signal actually flows through. All right, okay, so just to, to see that we're on the same page, understanding the, the three different types of muscle. All right, what is common to all three kinds of muscle is that there are some proteins, contractile proteins, which allow, which actually do the conversion of the chemical energy in ATP to ADP ratio to be converted into mechanical energy, into movement or pressure, etc., etc. Okay, so mechanical work. Now, what are these proteins and how they are arranged in these muscle cells? Yeah, so the, the main two are actin and myosin. There are many other proteins which are associated with them, and we'll see them throughout the lecture. But actin and myosin is where the magic happens, where the, the conversion of chemical energy to mechanical energy occurs. And in different types of muscle cells, these actin and myosin uh, fibers are organized in certain ways. So how does it work? Yeah, of course. Um, so how does it work? Sorry, the question was actin and myosin, okay, how are they arranged in the different types of muscle cells? Because it's different, right? Mm -hmm. uh, myosin in the middle. So so what so sarcomere a sarcomere is a section of uh, not really of a cell. Not really of a muscle fiber, no. Yes, that is true. But if we take a muscle fiber, okay, let's talk about skeletal muscle, what do we find inside? Myofibrils. We find myofibrils, and these myofibrils are composed of actin and myosin, right? Arranged in some hexagonal structure, that's not that important, if we make a cross-section we would see something. And they are also, in striated muscle, they are organized in sarcomeres, which is the the pattern that we can see in a microscope, which is just basically showing how the two um, or we now know that the, the sarcomeres are formed by um, a partial overlap between the two types of proteins, right? Between actin fibers and myosin fibers. All right. Um, with myosin, we have different types of myosin, different subtypes. Does anyone recall anything about myosin as a protein? We have myosin 1 and 2, correct. And the one that we find in... Um, in muscles, as the contractile protein is? 
is myosin 2, okay. And um, what, what are the characteristics of myosin 2? Okay, so first of all, it is a dimer. It forms dimers, okay. And the monomers themselves have very specific structure, which is a pretty long tail, okay, a helical tail. And then there's a globular head like this, okay. And this is the heavy chain. And in addition, as you correctly said, there are two more light chains which are associated with the head, okay. There are two light chains. And since myosin 2 is forming dimers, we have two of those. So these tails are intertwined and there's another head next to it, okay. Uh, and again, with its own two light chains, okay. So this is what myosin 2 looks like as a dimer. But in the, the structure of the myofibril, the thick filaments, so the thick filaments are which protein? Myosin. They're myosin, okay, so the thick filaments are composed of myosin. And the thick filaments themselves are not just this one dimer of myosin 2, but actually there are many, many dimers which are connected next to each other like this to form the whole thick filament, okay? So the name thick filament is kind of suggestive because it's big, okay, lots of proteins. And the, the dimers of myosin 2, which are composed of two heavy chains, the, the whole dimer is composed of two heavy chains and four light chains, right? And they are arranged along the, um, or into the thick filament in such a way that the heads are sticking out from the filament. So if we looked at the cross section of the thick filament, we would see those heads sticking out like this, okay? And this then allows the whole thick filament with the mouse in heads to interact with, with actin, which are with what kind of filaments? Thin filaments, okay, with actin, all right? So this is the structure of myosin 2. The structure of actin is also a little complex, right? It's not just a, the filament itself is composed of, how does it made or how is it? Actin dimers. Hmm. Yeah, so there is something called G-actin, which is a globular protein, right? So some kind of globular thing. And then in order to get an F-actin, F we have to polymerize, we have to bind a lot of them together. And what we get is actually a double helix composed of two strands of polymerized G-actin forming F-actin, okay? So the structure or just yeah, looks like this. And there are these long fibers connected, individual G-actin molecules bound together. Okay. We need ATP for this polymerization, etc. This is something that you've seen before, but it's not super important for what we're going to be talking about today. Right. Uh, the uh, the two the, the thick filaments and the thin filaments obviously interact. Okay, and it's usually a good idea to kind of to understand what is going on. Well, either you know just search for a YouTube video and you will see it, an animation of how that works. But it's usually a good idea to have like switch the different perspectives. One is looking at it like this, okay? So this is the thick filament and there will be the thin filament next to it. And switching between a cross section where you can see all the different parts kind of moving in a cross section, all right? Now the final thing about the, the structures, if we look at, well actually we can do that later. Um, I was going to talk about the, the, how is it arranged in the cell, but we can actually get to that later. All right, so the whole principle of what muscle does is that the myosin heads themselves can bind ATP, they can hydrolyze it, and they can use the, the drop in Gibbs energy through ATP hydrolysis to move along to basically kind of step along the actin fiber, which means that the thin and thick filaments slide into one another. And this is what shortens the muscle, okay? Of course, there are other proteins which attach the sarcomeres and everything to other parts of the, uh, uh, of the cell, and this leads to a shortening 
uh, upon contraction. Okay. Let's now have a look at the details of how that actually works on the on the level of um, actin and myosin. So I will simplify the picture a little bit. So I'm not going to be drawing the whole thick filament or the complex structure of the actin of the of the thin filaments. I will just be looking at kind of idealized actin and just one head, just one head of myosin. Okay. Okay, so this is an actin filament, and this is one head of myosin. But remember, we're, we, we never see this, okay? We always see a thick filament with lots of heads sticking out and interacting with the actin fibers around. All right, now, the, the whole conversion of ATP to movement is a cycle, okay? So it moves cyclically, and for each ATP molecule which is hydrolyzed, the actin head moves a little bit along the actin filament, okay? So we get a cycle, but in the cycle, we end up a little bit further away along the filament, okay? Because I'm gonna be drawing it just as a cycle, I can't really move it, I can't really show how that moves along, but just be aware that for each of the cycle as it runs, the, uh, the head moves along the actin filament. And again, be aware that there are thousands of myosin heads and they each move a little bit each cycle. Okay, so this cycle is a cycle for one myosin head. There are thousands of them, and each of them completes a lot of cycles for the macroscopic uh, shortening of the muscle. Yeah, good. So let's start with this state of actin and myosin, where myosin, the myosin head, is bound to the actin filament, and it's bound pretty strongly and nothing else happens, basically, okay? So this complex of actin and myosin, when they are bound together pretty strongly, is also called the rigor complex, which is named after rigor mortis, which is what happens after death, when a person has been dead for a few tens of minutes, okay? Um, all their muscles seize up. They are very hard to move or impossible to move. Okay, they become very, very um, yeah, unmovable, yeah, stuck. And this is the state in which we find actin and myosin. Okay, so they're bound strongly together, which means that we can't really move them, move the, uh, the two types of filaments apart from each other, okay, because they're stuck. Yeah, so this is a rigor complex called after rigor mortis. So this happens after death, but if we are alive, uh, and the, the cells are functioning, what happens in the next step is that there is some ATP around, and the ATP binds to the myosin head, which releases or decreases the affinity of myosin to the actin, so the two can be released. So in the next step, what we have is myosin head with a bound ATP, with a bound molecule of ATP, and the bond between uh, actin and myosin is released. Okay? This can lead, this step alone, will lead to a relaxation of the muscle because there are some other proteins which kind of pull the whole thing apart. Okay? For example, a very big protein called titin is one that, or titan, which pulls the thing apart. Okay? But that's not super important here. Right? So in the first step, the ATP binds and the bond is released. Now, in the next step, and from the point of view of the molecular mechanism, it's one of the most important steps of the whole thing. Uh, what happens in the, in the head, the head itself of myosin has ATPase activity. So it's able to hydrolyze ATP to ADP and phosphate. And this is exactly what happens in the next step. Okay, so inside the head, there's hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and phosphate. Both of the products remain in the head. So we, we're not really releasing anything out. Okay? It all remains inside the enzyme. You can imagine as, a, as an active site of an enzyme or something like that. But crucially, 
this hydrolysis of ATP leads to a conformational change in the protein. And the main change is that the angle between the head and the tail of the myosin molecule, or you can imagine between the head and the thick filament, the whole big thick filament, changes. Okay? So you could, you could basically look at it as if a spring is you know, elongated or something and prepared then to, to shorten. So hydrolysis of ATP, everything remains inside, but the angle changes. And the products ADP and phosphate just remain inside the head, right? Now, in the next step, or rather, as this happens, the affinity of myosin to actin increases again. Okay, so it was really high here. They were really bound strongly. Then it decreased when ATP bound. But as the ATP is hydrolyzed, the affinity of the two increases again. So basically, if nothing else is present here, myosin would want to stick back to actin. Okay. However, in our cells, this is the step where something, some regulatory step has to happen, some, some signaling has to happen for the cycle to proceed. So without some step X, and we'll see in a second, the whole thing would, would stop here. Okay, and would be waiting for a signal to keep completing the, um, the, uh, the whole cycle. Okay? So to say it in a different way, after death, all of our muscles are in this configuration. Okay? When we are alive and our cells are working, but the muscle is not contracting, all the myosin heads will be in this configuration and we'll, we'll be waiting for the signal to start basically running the whole cycle. Does it make sense? Good. So some regulatory step. If the regulatory step actually goes through, this myosin molecule with ATP and phosphate, with ADP, sorry, with ADP and phosphate still bound to it, binds to actin. And in the next step, two things happen. First is that the phosphate is released. And as that happens, the angle between the head and the tail, or the head of the, and the filament, basically springs back to the original position, is released. Okay, so we had a spring that was prepared to be released, and now it, now it kind of slams back. Okay, so what we have is that we are back in this situation, in this configuration, and you can imagine that what happens there is that there is a movement of one to the other. Yeah? We started, we started with, the, with the myosin head like this, and as it moved back to the original, the, the relaxed configuration, it moved the actin filament along with it because it was bound to it quite strongly. Yeah? Good. In the next step, what happens is that ADP is released, there are no further big conformational changes. There are some small conformational changes when we release the ADP. And the result is that we get back to the rigor complex. And the only thing really that happens is that the, the, the strength of the bond between uh, actin and myosin is strengthened, is increased. Okay, so the release of ATP makes the complex stronger. All right? Again, if ATP is present, the whole thing continues all the way up to here. Okay, if a signal comes, then it is completed. Yes? Sorry, sorry, but, um, it's for what kind of I, I, will, I will tell you in a second, okay? You, you will see in a second because then we will go through the signal in quite some detail. So signal comes and then again is attached to Correct. So if the signal is on, this thing just keeps going as long as there is ATP available. It will just keep going. When the signal goes away, the whole thing stops here. When ATP goes away, everything stops here. Okay? If you could, <coughs> sorry, if you could uh, call the top part as the rigor complex or the rigor state, yep. what could we call the older? Like um, I guess that would be a relaxed state, yeah. But it becomes a little confusing because if we talk about myosin, 
the relaxed conformation is actually this one, not that one, okay? That is not relaxed, that is ready to spring back, okay? So it, it, it becomes a little confusing, what, what do you mean? But for the actomyosin complex, you could say this would be the relaxed state, yes. Or for the whole muscle, this would be the relaxed state, all right? Okay, so once again, this is a cycle for one myosin head. There are thousands of them on each filament, and they kind of gradually just walk around the, uh, the actin filament and slide against the actin filament inside, and this is what causes the shortening of the muscle, okay? So it's not just one thing, it's thousands of them moving by nanometers step by step. Okay? Good. Now, what is this signal X? The signal X is calcium, is an increase in calcium. Okay, calcium is a typical second messenger. It's a messenger, it's an intracellular messenger that really regulates a lot of things in the cell. And in this case, calcium, increase in calcium allows the cycle to just, just keep going. If the calcium goes down, everything stops here, okay? So the, the main intracellular mediator of contraction is calcium. But as we'll see in a second, the, the steps that precede the increase in calcium and also what happens inside the muscle are different for the different types of muscle cell. So for striated muscles, so cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle, calcium binds to a special sensor very good, yes, troponin, called troponin. And troponin is a complex of proteins. It's actually a complex of three subunits, troponin C, troponin I, and troponin T. So three proteins. And these three proteins, these three subunits, which form a complex, are connected to another protein, which is called tropomyosin. So troponin has three subunits, and they're connected to tropomyosin. Now, how does it work, and how do they work as a switch, which allows the, uh, which, which allows us to stop or to proceed with the, with the contraction? Well, basically, on the actin double helix, the F actin double helix, there are binding sites, there are places where the myosin head wants to bind, okay? And these are, in striated muscle, these are obscured by this troponin tropomyosin complex. So you could, so these would be the three troponin subunits. I'm not drawing how it actually looks, okay? There are, it's a complex protein. Um, and they are connected by a longer molecule of tropomyosin, which blocks the groove on the actin filament into which myosin head wants to bind. Okay, so under normal conditions when calcium is low, this troponin tropomyosin complex is blocking the access of myosin head to the actin filament because it's blocking the groove where it wants to bind. When the concentration of calcium increases inside the cell, and by the way, do you know what the, what, do you know what the extracellular, normal extracellular concentration of calcium is approximately? Huh? Milli? I think if you say two millimolar, that's a pretty good guess, okay? Two millimolar. So if you say 1.4 milli equivalents, well, the, is almost right, okay? Uh, but n we don't really use milliequivalents anymore, okay? So two millimolar is pretty good for extracellular. How is it intracellularly? Hmm? Yeah, it's about 100 nanomolar or something like that, okay? So we are about four orders of magnitude or something lower, okay? And when the signal comes, when the extracellular signal comes, again, we'll see that in a second how that works, okay? the concentration of calcium moves from about 100 nanomolar to about one micromolar or something like that, okay? So this is the change in concentration, which means that calcium binds to troponin C, the C stands for calcium, okay? So it binds to troponin C, which causes conformational change and the movement 
of tropomyosin away from the groove into which myosin wants to bind. Okay? So in striated muscle, this is, there is an increase in calcium, troponin tropomyosin complex moves away from the, the blocking position, and that means that the whole cycle can go on as long as there is enough calcium, as there is high enough concentration of calcium. When the concentration of calcium drops, the whole thing moves back, and the cycle stops here. This question, yeah. Um, I think it's actually bi it's actually binding between the two. Okay, so there's like a little groove, and and it, I think the binding site is is actually shared by the two neighboring molecules. But to be completely fair, the F actin in the uh, uh, in the thin filament contains also other proteins. It's it's a more complicated comp complex. It's not just G actin molecules. So there are other binding partners. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated. But yeah, I don't think it is one one on one. It's actually kind of in between. All right. Is this clear how this works? Okay, so that's for striated muscle. In smooth muscle, there is no troponin tropomyosin complex. It's not there. So in theory, or no, uh, in practice, the binding site on actin for myosin are there all the time. They're not obscured by anything. The regulation in smooth muscle occurs through a different mechanism, and that is that the increase of calcium activates an enzyme called myosin light chain kinase. Myosin light chain kinase. And this kinase phosphorylates one of the light chains on the myosin heads. And this allows the cycle to go on. So basically, without the phosphorylation on one of the side chains, the myosin, although it has all the binding sites that it needs, it doesn't really have the affinity to start binding to actin. And it has to be phosphorylated first. Once it's phosphorylated, the cycle runs the same way as it would in a skeletal muscle or a cardiac muscle. Okay? So in smooth muscle, the, the, uh, the regulation is quite radically different, through a radically different mechanism. What was the name of it? ML. Myosin light chain kinase. Okay, so it phosphorylates one of the light chains at a specific place. And this is different phosphorylation from the, from the hydrolysis of ADC. It's completely unrelated. Okay, this is a re regulatory phosphorylation. It just happened once, and once it's there, the whole thing continues. Okay, so those two things, the hydrolysis is unrelated. The hydrolysis of ATP for the movement actually occurs in the heavy chain, not in the light chain. Okay? Good. So that's the general mechanism of what happens in all three types of, of muscle tissue. Now let's have a look at what has to happen for the calcium to increase, because that's going to be different between the three different types. So what makes, what causes the increase of calcium? Because the rest, we already know how that works, right? So let's first have a look at skeletal muscle. We already reviewed a little bit the, the structure of it. So we know that there are very long fibers. And inside the fiber, so if we had a cross-section of a muscle fiber, we would have a lot of myofibrils, okay, which are segmented into sarcomeres. Yeah, lots of myofibrils like this. And in addition, we would have invaginations of the membrane, actually much longer, okay? It can go all the way inside the cell, which are called T-tubules, okay? So lots of, lots of invaginations of the membrane around lots and lots of myofibrils, okay? And we would also see, not maybe from this view, but we also see other organelles, and the most important there, in addition to all these ones, are Hmm? Amitochondria and sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so if we don't look at the cross section like this, but we we cut the uh, the fiber along the long axis, we would see something like this. So this is a sarcolemma, yeah, sarcoplasmic membrane. We would have some 
cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is T-tubule, sarcoplasmic reticulum. These in skeletal muscle form, what is this structure? Yeah, it's a triad in skeletal muscle. Yeah, we have triads looking like this, two cisterns and a T-tubule, okay? We would have mitochondria, okay? Again, take this as a cross-section of the mitochondria, so there's a mitochondrial network, okay? And next to this whole thing, we would have the myofibrils. organized in sarcomeres, yeah? This is the organization of a, of a muscle fiber, okay? Again, this is one view, this is the other view. So the T-tubules go inside the fiber and all the other organelles are gonna be arra arranged around them. Yeah, does it make sense? It's something that you've seen before. All right, so we want to cause a contraction of a smooth muscle. What is the signal for that? How do we make a smooth muscle contract? Yeah, that's what happens inside the cell. Huh? Skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle. And how does acetylcholine come to? That's acetylcholine, yeah. And which? And how does it get there? Through the blood, or how does it come? Yes. Well, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, and my question is, how does it get to the muscle fiber? Huh? Yes. Okay. So the signal. The signal for muscle contraction comes from a motor neuron, from a nerve cell, because we'll see that it's different for other types of cells, uh, other types of muscle, okay? It's specific for skeletal muscle. It comes from a neuron. Now, there is a special interface between the neuron and the, um, uh, and the muscle fiber, which is called, it is a type of synapse. You could say that it's a modified synapse but specifically here, motor plate is another name for it. It's called neuromuscular junction. Neuromuscular junction. Yeah? Neuromuscular junction, it's a synapse between a nerve cell and a muscle cell, skeletal muscle cell, right? And in this synapse, in this neuromuscular junction, as you said correctly, when the nerve cell is excited, the, sy the synaptic end releases a neurotransmitter, which specifically here is always acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft or into the neuromuscular junction in this specific case. And what happens then? Not yet, not yet, okay? So on the membrane, inside the, so let, let me redraw it so you can see some internal stuff. So in the neuromuscular junction, on the sarcolemma, we have receptors for acetylcholine called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. We'll, we'll cover all the receptors in the next course in quite some detail, but just for now, they are called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Nicotinic because they bind nicotine, okay? So nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are actually ligand-gated ion channels. They're ion channels which open when acetylcholine binds to them, okay? So acetylcholine comes in, binds to these receptors, which causes ion channels to open. Now, the ion channels, which are nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, are primarily permeable for sodium and a little bit for calcium. They're also permeable for potassium, but I will not complicate it at this point. We'll cover that in a later lecture, how that works, okay? So, basically what happens is that sodium ions, well, I could have asked you, but you probably know that sodium ions, when, when a sodium channel opens, sodium flows inside, why? Because the Because there's a concentration gradient, okay? So there's more sodium outside, and less sodium inside, and there's another reason. There's a membrane potential, okay? There's a membrane potential which is negative inside, okay? Maybe minus 70 or something like that, millivolts. So these two forces basically pull sodium inside when those sodium channels open, right? Good. That causes 
a depolarization of the membrane in the neuromuscular junction. A depolarization means that the potential moves from, let's say, minus 70, minus 80 or something like that, moves to more positive values. Okay? That's depolarization. Now, this depolarization then opens another kind of channels, which are called voltage-gated sodium channels, or voltage-dependent sodium channels. There are different names for them. Voltage-dependent or voltage-gated sodium channels. These are one of the most important, so, uh, most important ion channels that we'll see. We'll see them many, many times. They are super important for signaling in the nervous system, in muscles, and elsewhere, in the heart. So these are voltage-gated or voltage-dependent. So unlike the acetylcholine receptors, which are ligand-gated, so they open when a ligand binds, in this case acetylcholine, these are voltage-gated channels, so they open in response to depolarization of the membrane. So when the potential changes, they open. Okay? Again, we'll cover that at a later lecture, how that actually works on a molecular level. But for now, let's just know that this local depolarization will open these channels, which means that more sodium will start flowing in, and the depolarization of the membrane will kind of spread along the sarcolemma, because there are many, 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 many voltage-gated sodium channels which will spread the depolarization along the membrane. Okay? And the depolarization will spread all the way through the T-tubules, so that means that the depolarization will flow inside the, um, the muscle fiber. Yeah? Good. Now, in addition to these, to these voltage-gated sodium channels, we also have on the membrane, we also have voltage-gated calcium channels. And they work in a similar way. So when the membrane depolarizes, they open. Okay? Now, these channels... I mean, they are, find, they are found along the whole sarcolemma, but they are especially concentrated in the T-tubules. And their opening causes the influx of sodium. Again, we said that there's much less, sorry, influx of calcium. We said that there's much less calcium inside the cell, right? Let's say 100 nanometer, uh, nanomolar or something like that, which is much, much less than the 2 millimolar outside. Okay? So calcium can flow in. Now, this opening of these, let me uh, name them. So these are voltage-gated or voltage-dependent calcium channels. Yeah. The opening of these voltage-gated calcium channels will cause the opening of another type of channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And these are called ryanodine receptors. I will explain it again. So these are ryanodine receptors or RYR. So once again, on the sarcolemma, these voltage-gated calcium channels open and their opening opens channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is the reason why we have these triads, why we have the cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum so close to the T-tubule, so that the two types of channels can communicate. Okay? So the opening of those calcium channels will open the calcium channels on the, on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which will then cause a massive release a massive release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum because the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a very important store of calcium. Now, the rest of the story we already covered. Okay, so what happens then? What happens to the calcium? Hmm? It binds to troponin C, okay, causes conformational change, and the contraction along the, these myofibrils can start. Okay? Yep. The calcium from the first uh, voltage dependent is getting also to the cell. Yeah, I'll get to that right now. Okay? I will explain that because that's important. Okay? So, this is the process. Now, 
how does it happen that the ryanodine receptors in the sarcoplasmic reticulum open? Now, most ryanodine receptors are ligand-gated ion channels, and the ligand that opens them is calcium. So they are, generally speaking, they are calcium-regulated calcium channels. In a different perspective, basically, well, they are, they are a means of amplifying an increase, a local increase of calcium, and they amplify it by, by releasing massive amounts of calcium. That's what they do, and that's what they do in all cells. Okay? Now, specifically in the skeletal muscle, it appears that many, potentially probably not all, but many of the voltage-gated calcium channels which are on the sarcolemma are connected directly, physically, with the ryanodine receptors on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what opens these, the, ryanodine the ryanodine receptors in the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the physical change in conformation of these voltage-gated calcium channels in the sarcolemma. So to your question, generally speaking, it is this little bit of calcium that goes in that opens the ryanodine receptors and releases a lot. Yeah, but here, what opens this channel is not the sodium, it's the change in potential. But here, it is the calcium, which has to bind and open the other channel. Okay? Generally speaking, in skeletal muscle, at least some of these voltage-gated uh, calcium channels are directly connected to the ryanodine receptors. So if we just made a close-up, Okay, there will be a direct connection between the two, and the opening of this one will open this one and release, release the calcium. Okay, this is super important because it's different in the other types of, of muscle. Okay, so I hope you all understand this. All right, so this is the mechanism through which calcium is released in, from the sarco primarily from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and can activate the, uh, the contraction cycle. Now, when the signal from acetylcholine is stopped, and it is stopped by means of acetylcholine esterase, which is an enzyme which is residing in the, in the extracellular space and which just breaks down acetylcholine to choline and, and acetate. So this stops the signal. The membrane repolarizes. And again, we'll cover that at, at a future lecture, how that actually works. Okay? So the, the, the membrane potential comes back to its original uh, value. All the channels close, including the channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, they all close. And the calcium which was released into the cytoplasm is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by means of a pump called circa, or sarcoplasmic, or sorry, smooth endoplasmic reticulum calcium pump, circa. A very, very, very important enzyme, very important pump. So it takes the calcium which was released and pumps it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum so that the whole thing can start again when the signal comes for contraction. Okay, are we clear about this? So what was the enzyme that you said uh, the acetylcholine gets? Uh... It's called acetylcholine esterase. Okay, it breaks down acetylcholine to acetate and choline. Okay, acetylcholine esterase. Good. Everything is clear about this because you, it's important that you completely understand this because then with the other types of muscle, I will just say, okay, this is the same thing and here it's different. Okay? So it's important that you get, get this, but it looks like it's quite clear. Good. Let's take a, well, a four-minute break okay? and uh, we'll continue with the other types of muscle. All right. So let's uh, move on to the next muscle or muscle type. Um, before we cover the similarities and differences between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, so the other type of, of striated muscle, let me just add a couple of uh, terminological things. Um, the, 
So let me just remind you, okay, this is the T tubule, this is the sarcolemma, okay? This is the cistern of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. There will be another one on the other side, okay? This is the, the voltage-gated calcium channel, and this is the ryanodine receptor, which releases then calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay? So that we all know what we're talking about. Now, the specific, uh, Type or there is a different name for the voltage-gated uh, calcium channels, and they are often called dihydropyridine receptors. So I just want to put it out there, okay? Dihydropyridine receptors. Dihydro This is more of a kind of a hook to pharmacology, okay? Because these dihydropyridine receptors can bind medications called dihydropyridines, and they are mostly effective because they block the, uh, they block the channel. They are most e effective in, in decreasing heart rate and decreasing blood pressure, okay? I will explain that in a second how, how that works, okay? Dihydropyridine, okay, receptors. So it's just a different name for the voltage-gated calcium channels, for these type of voltage-gated calcium channels, okay? There's nothing mysterious about it, it's just a different name, and I will use it later on so, to, so that, so I just want to make sure uh, that we are on the, uh, on the same page. Now, the other thing, and this is already coming to the comparison with cardiac muscle, in the skeletal muscle, the ryanodine receptor that we have in, in the smooth uh, uh, endoplasmic reticulum is type 1, ryanodine receptor type 1. And that's the one which can form physical connections with the dihydropyridine receptor with the voltage-gated uh, calcium channel on the, on the sarcolemma, okay? And therefore, the coupling between the depolarization here of the sarcolemma and the opening of the sarcoplasmic reticulum channels is, at least in part, mediated by physical contact, okay? So the calcium which flows in through those channels, through the channels on the, on the sarcolemma, those dihydropyridine receptors, is not crucial for the initiation of contraction in the skeletal muscle. And this is super important, so I'll repeat it again. The calcium which flows in through the opening of the voltage-gated calcium channels on the sarcolemma is not essential for the initiation of contraction. What is essential is that the opening of those channels is physically transmitted onto the ryanodine receptors, and then they open and release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So extracellular calcium, calcium which is outside of the cell, is not really that important for the contraction of the muscle, of skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle can contract for a while, not forever, but for a while it can contract even in the absence of extracellular calcium because, at least partly, the connection between the two is done through the physical contact. Does this make sense? Good. Moving to cardiac muscle. In the cardiac muscle, as a striated muscle, most of these things are exactly the same but some are not, okay? So structurally speaking, we don't have triads in the cardiac muscle, right? We only have dyads. There's only one cistern with a T-tubule. The arrangement is a little bit different, but most of the other things inside the cell are practically the same, okay? Now, what are the differences? One big difference is, what is the stimulus for contraction in cardiac muscle? Yeah, so it's its own electrical activity or electrical activity of the SA node, which are specialized cells, special myocardial cells, which, through some mechanism that we'll cover mostly next year, produce repetitive rhythmical impulses, depolarizations, okay? And these depolarizations, so there is no nerve cell, there is no acetylcholine, I mean, there is acetylcholine, but for other purposes, okay? So we don't need any external signal, the heart is making its own signals. And the depolarization which occurs, which starts in the SA node, 
then travels through the myocardium by means, mainly, of the gap junctions in the intercalated discs that we just talked about. Okay? So those allow the depolarization to flow through the myocardial, the whole my myocardium, in order to get into, into the whole muscle so that it can contract. So that means that we can skip all this stuff with acetylcholine for cardiac muscle, and we already are in the stage of voltage-gated sodium channels, which just keep opening because it's depolarizing, and, and what we get is basically, it's called action potential. It's a, it's a wave of depolarization which runs through the myocardium. The depolarization of the membrane causes, again, in the T-tubules, causes the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels, and the opening of, calcium, uh, of voltage gated calcium channels causes the opening of ryanodine receptors and the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So those steps are basically the same as in the skeletal muscle. The crucial difference, and the difference which is important pharmacologically as also, is that in cardiac muscle, there is no physical contact between the dihydropyridine receptors the voltage-gated calcium channels, and the ryanodine receptors. There's no physical contact between them. That means that calcium must flow in, must go from the extracellular space into the intracellular space in order for the ryanodine receptors to open. There must be some inflow of calcium. It doesn't have to be a lot. Usually this is called just calcium sparks because it's just a little bit of calcium that flows in and causes the opening of ryanodine receptors and a massive release of calcium, okay? But these sparks are important. Without them, cardiac muscle would not contract. So that's a big, crucial difference, okay? And we will ask you about it, okay? So this is, this is a big, important difference between the two types of striated muscle. Now, since the ryanodine receptors are not physically connected in the cardiac muscle, we also have different subtypes of ryanodine receptors, and it is, so in cardiac muscle we have ryanodine receptors type 2, which are not physically connected with the dihydropyridine receptors. So this is for cardiac muscle. There is a disorder connected, a genetic, at least partly genetic disorder, connected to ryanodine receptors. As I said, ryanodine receptors are in all tissues, they are super important because they are controlling the release of calcium from sarcoplasmic reticulum. But specifically, ryanodine receptor 1, there are people who have mutations in ryanodine receptor 1, and this can, these mutations, can cause, under very specific conditions, can cause a condition, potentially fatal condition, called malignant hypothermia. Malignant hyperthermia. So basically, malignant overheating. How does it work and in what condition, in, in what situation does it work? Usually, this occurs in major surgery, when people undergo major surgery, and they get general anesthesia and muscle relaxants. So in many types of surgery, the patients are given muscle relaxants, so uh, medications that kind of stop the contraction of skeletal muscle. The main reason being that basically they're not pushing the organs from the abdomen and stuff like that. Okay, it's much easier to operate on a completely relaxed patient. And the anesthetics themselves are usually not enough or you would have to use a much larger dose. So you combine general anesthetics with muscle relaxants. In some people that have some mutations in ryanodine receptor 1, this combination causes the opening, the uncontrolled opening of ryanodine receptors and this leads to a massive release of calcium into their skeletal muscle. And the, and the end result is basically that as we release calcium, as we increase calcium in the skeletal muscle, the, actin, the actomyosin cycle starts running. But since it is completely uncoordinated, unregulated, you won't get any movements because for that you have to control all the muscle fibers in a very specific way to get movement. So what you get is muscle stiffness, the patients become very stiff, 
like in rigor mortis, but it's not rigor mortis, it's a different thing. So their muscles become very stiff and they start producing massive amounts of heat because we are expending free energy, we are, we are decreasing Gibbs energy, but not doing any work, so the energy has to go somewhere, right? And it is released as heat. And they start overheating pretty quickly and it can kill them. So this is called malignant hyperthermia. It's a relatively rare condition, but if it happens, it has to be treated, otherwise the patients could die pretty quickly. Well, there is a drug called dantrolene, um, which is a blocker of these receptors. Uh, dantrolene, I think. Um, and really the only use of this is to treat malignant hypothermia, since it is a very rare disorder. I mean, previously it was used for other things, but now I think just for um, malignant hypothermia. It is a very rare condition, so most hospitals don't, for example, even have stores of dantrolene because they would have to be changing them all the time and throwing it out. So there is usually in like a city, there are just two places, one or two places where they have them. And if it happens, they call and they bring the medication and to be treated, okay? Maybe that's changed, maybe now everybody has it because it's cheaper, but this is how it used to be. Um, so giving dantrolene, but most importantly, cooling the patient down, okay? So you cool the patient down, you give dantrolene, which is, which is actually a pretty, uh, there's a lot of side effects, it's a very complicated medication, etc. So this is a, uh, a condition that if you are uh, an anesthetist, for example, later on, you may come across with malignant. It's a rare thing, but it does happen. And it's good to know that it's related to our friends here, rhinoidine receptors, type 1, and uh, a mutation in them. You want to ask something? Why malignant? Uh, malignant just means that it can lead to death. It's like bad. Malignant means bad. Okay. I mean, this happens in minutes. Yeah, they're not gonna lose a lot of weight, okay? Right, um, okay, so I wanted also to show that if the contraction cycle, if the, if the cycling of actin myosin happens without doing work, it will start producing heat. It, does, it produces heat even when it is moving, but less than when there is no work done, okay? Again, thermodynamics, energy can't be lost, okay, so it is released as heat in this, in this situation. All right, so that's, those were the, the two types of striated muscle. This is how, how the uh, contraction or stimulus contraction coupling works in the two muscles. For smooth muscle, things are completely different. First of all, Smooth muscle cells don't really have this elaborate structure, right? They look like pretty much normal cells, like fibroblasts or something like that. They do have internally a network of contractile proteins, of actin and myosin, but it is not really organized into myofibrils and into sarcomeres, hence smooth muscle, because we can't really see the, the internal structures. So we do have actin and myosin there, but it's organized in a different way. The the cycle, the actin myosin cycle, works the same way. There's no difference there. But as we said, the regulatory step or the, the connection between increase of calcium, intracellular calcium, and the contraction starting is mediated by an enzyme called myosin light chain kinase. So basically what we get is through some stimulus, which could be a nerve stimulus or it could be a hormone, which opens calcium channels or it can go through sarcoplasmic reticulum and release calcium. There are many different ways how we can increase calcium inside the cell. So calcium increases, yeah, it could be a, a nerve signal or it could be a hormone coming in and binding to a receptor. Okay, many different possibilities how we can cause smooth muscle to contract. Calcium increases and as we said, then calcium binds to myosin light chain kinase and activates it. And myosin light chain kinase phosphorylates one of the light chains on each of the heads, okay, and allows it to bind to actin and to start cycling and, and kind of walking around the actin or walking across the actin filament. Now, how can we stop this? Okay, in the case of uh, in the case of striated muscles, what we do is we stop these depolarizations, we pump all the calcium back in, 
And as we pump the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the concentration of calcium drops, the calcium is released from the troponin, and everything comes back to the original state. Okay? It's not surprising how that works. How can we do that in the smooth muscle? Well, since light chain is already phosphorylated, in order to stop the whole thing, to stop the contraction, we have to dephosphorylate it. Right? We have to remove the phosphate from the light chain. And this is done by another enzyme called myosin light chain phosphatase. So we have myosin light chain kinase, which phosphorylates it, and we have myosin light chain phosphatase, which dephosphorylates it. And in fact, the myosin light chain phosphatase is active all the time. It is present in the cell, it's just sitting and waiting for to do something. Okay? So the only thing that changes with the increase of calcium is the activation of myosin light chain kinase, which can phosphorylate the light chain. And the phosphatase just sits there and cuts the phosphates away. Okay? And this is, this is how we can regulate it. So if the calcium concentration goes down, myosin light chain kinase stops doing its thing, and myosin light chain phosphatase just cuts off all the phosphates and the whole thing stops again. Okay? So this is how contraction is regulated in smooth muscles, a completely different mechanism. There is calcium, but apart from increasing calcium, the, all the other details are completely different from the striated muscle. Okay? Big difference. Right. Any questions about this regulation in the smooth muscle? No questions? All right. Good. So that means that we can move to the last part of the lecture and talk a little bit about how ATP is produced and how it's used in the, in the muscle. So I'm just going to... We've seen this before, so I'm going to just use a, a skeletal muscle fiber. But this time we're not going to be interested in any of this. We are going to be interested in the mitochondria, which are, actually many of them are, located basically right next to the sarcomeres, right next to the myofibrils. Remember I said that for that anything inside the cell, when it has to diffuse very far, it's going to be inefficient, it's not going to work, we're going to lose some energy. You don't want any diffusion. You want to put everything as close to each other as possible. Okay? So this is what happens in, um, in this case, in skeletal muscle, but it's similar in cardiac muscle as well, where you have mitochondria right next to the sarcomeres. And that means that the ATP, which is produced through all the pathways that we mentioned, okay, including, by the way, including glycolysis, because glycolytic enzymes are usually very closely connected to mitochondria as well. Okay? So the way we usually draw the metabolic pathways, it looks like it starts somewhere up here and then the intermediates come closer and closer to the mitochondrion and then pyruvate can enter the mitochondrion. But that's not the case. I mean, glycolytic enzymes like glucokinase and or hexokinase are actually very closely connected. They are right next door to, to mitochondria. Again, so that we don't have to move things around too much. So, ATP produced both in oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis is produced very close to, to where we need it, where we are going to be using it. However, there is another trick there. ATP is basically too big and too charged, I mean mostly it's ADP which is difficult, to diffuse. Okay? It's just too big. Okay? It, it's not going to diffuse very far. So many cells, including muscle cells, actually most cells really use this mechanism is, and I already mentioned it in the oxidative phosphorylation lecture, what happens to the ATP which is produced in these pathways, it gets changed into a different carrier of a high energy phosphate called creatine phosphate. Creatine phosphate. O 
example, phosphocreatine. You can see both both uh, terms, phosphate. So what happens is that ATP reacts with creatine to form creatine phosphate and ADP. This is a perfectly reversible reaction. We're not really using losing at least not too much free energy. It's almost at equilibrium, okay? Not a massive changes in free energy. And this enzyme uh, this reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme creatine kinase. Creatine kinase. It can go this way or that way. So, if we look at a mitochondrion, we have ATP synthase. You remember everything about ATP synthase, right? It's in the inner mitochondrial membrane, but it produces ATP into the matrix. And from the matrix, the ATP which is produced from it is exported across the inner mitochondrial membrane through a transporter called ANT, ANT transporter, adenonucleotide transporter. Now this ATP, which is produced here, doesn't get very far because on the inner mitochondrial membrane, in the intermembrane space, there is creatine kinase waiting. It takes the ATP, which is produced here, takes the phosphate, puts it onto creatine, and returns the ADP back into the mitochondrion so that it can be recharged with another phosphate through oxidative phosphorylation. So this ATP, because I said ATP and ADP, they're too big, they're not gonna diffuse very far. They're really just moving across the membrane. They're not going anywhere, okay? They're produced here, they're moved into the intermembrane space. There, the phosphate, the last phosphate is chopped off. It's put onto creatine phosphate, and then the ADP comes back and is recharged, and it just cycles around. And it is the creatine phosphate which, which leaves the mitochondrion. So we get creatine phosphate leaving the mitochondrion and moving to the sarcomere, to the myofibril. There, there is another molecule of creatine kinase which takes ADP, puts the phosphate back in to make ATP so that myosin can bind it and use it in the cycle. So this is what is called a creatine shuttle or creatine phosphate shuttle. And it is a general method for moving these high energy phosphates along the cell to where, to the, from the places where it's produced to the places where it's consumed without needing to move around ATP. So this is true for muscle cells, this is true for epithelial cells, for specialized epithelial cells, for example, in the inner ear. So basically all cells that are, that are consuming a lot of energy for some process, for some processes, will use this creatine phosphate shuttle. Okay, so that we, can't, we don't have to move ATP or ADP around. Um, so the same thing is true actually for ATP produced in the glycolysis. So as I said, the glycolytic enzymes are closely up close by, okay? And the ATP which is produced in glycolysis is immediately changed to creatine phosphate, which then moves to the sarcomere where it's changed back to, to ATP, or the phosphate is taken, added to ADP, and is used then for the actomyosin cycle. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm not so sure, but, but if you say so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this distance is very, very short, okay? So it's really, everything is very, very close to each other. But yes, it will have to diffuse a little bit. But creatine phosphate will diffuse much, e much more easily than ATP or ADP. Because it's smaller, and there are some other reasons. But, but yeah, one, one of the reasons is that it's smaller. Quite significant. It's about, it's about half the size of ATP. Creatinine. Not, not creatinine. It's called creatine. Creatine, yeah. 
Correct, yeah. But remember, the outer membrane is f relatively yeah. freely permeable, so there is no problem. Yes, it will, it will pass through the porins uh, that we talked about. Yeah. Now, one, one of the things that, and sorry if this is too abstract, but one of the things that this serves to prevent is, I'll, I'll explain it, okay, if it makes sense, it makes sense. If not, don't worry about it. Um, imagine that you have a mitochondrion which produces ATP and uses up ADP. So in the mitochondrion or at the mitochondrion close by, you would have a very high concentration of ATP and very low concentration of ADP because that's where ATP is produced, right? This means, again, if the ratio of ATP to ADP is high, it's very difficult to make more ATP because there's already a lot of ATP. So we would have to put a lot of energy into making ATP, yeah? Now, in the sarcomere, we would get the opposite problem because ATP is being consumed, so we would have very little ATP, and we would have a lot of ADP because it's being consumed. Now, if the ratio of ATP to ADP is small, that means that the amount of work that we can get from it is also small. So if we allowed ATP just to diffuse all the way to the sarcomere, we would need massive amounts of energy per ATP molecule here, and we would get very little energy from it by the time it diffused to the sarcomere. So actually, along the way, we would lose huge amounts of as heat. We would lose huge amounts of energy as heat, basically. And this is what the creatine phosphate system, shuttle, prevents. So we're not losing energy. We can move, we can move, move the diffusion much more easily than, than we would with ATP. And this is what saves a lot of energy and makes things quicker. Yeah. But the, the from the is the problem also. It is the problem for the production, because the further it is, you have to put more in, yeah? And then we use this, this in, the, in the muscle. You're right. I mean, here it is a problem, if so we keep it very far. Is there equilibrium between ATP and No, there's no, I mean, here we would be getting closer to equilibrium, but here we're actually very far from equilibrium. Yeah, but, th but this, is, this is a case, this is a hypothetical case. This is not what happens, okay? But here we would be very far from equilibrium, here we would be closer to equilibrium, so we would be losing free energy between the, just by diffusing. And this is what, creatine, what the creatine phosphate uh, shuttle prevents. So this means that we get very high concentrations of creatine kinase in the muscle, and this is part of the reason why we use it as a marker of muscle damage. So if a muscle is damaged, this creatine kinase is released into the bloodstream and we can measure it and we can find out, okay, there was a damage to the muscle. We have two types of creatine kinase in our body, two genes. Well, I mean, there's the mitochondrial one and then there are some cytoplasmic ones, but I will tell you about the cytoplasmic one because the mitochondrial one, there's just one, okay? But for the cytoplasmic creatine kinase, we have two subtypes. It's creatine kinase M, standing for muscle, and we have creatine kinase B, which stands for brain, where it was first discovered, okay? And a creatine kinase always exists as a dimer. So in the muscle, we get creatine kinase MM, it's a dimer. In some other tissues, including the brain, we would get a dimer creatine kinase BB, and in the cardiac muscle, we get a mixture. So we get CKMB, which is fairly specific for the cardiac muscle. And for a very long time, and to some extent it still is, this creatine kinase MB, this isoenzyme, is used as a marker of damage to the cardiac muscle, for example, in suspected myocardial infarction. Okay, so in heart attack, they will measure CKMB in your blood, and the level tells something about the damage to the cardiac muscle. Nowadays, we have even more specific and quicker markers of cardiac muscle damage, which are also used, and those are cardiac-specific troponins. 
So we have different troponins in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. They are still troponins, they do the same thing, but they are structurally different, we can distinguish them. So it's mostly the cardiac troponin I and T which are used as very quick and very specific markers of cardiac damage. Okay? So CKMB and these troponins we can detect and we do detect clinically in case of suspected heart attack or cardiac ischemia. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a debate which one is more specific and quicker and whatever. So, but but it's, it's, it's not really the troponin C that's not really measured. The last thing I just want to say is, so we talked about the production of ATP, the, the creatine phosphate, the creatine phosphate shuttle and everything. Now, what are, that's going to be the last thing, what are the main substrates for these types of muscle? So what do they work on? What, where do they get the ATP from? For the skeletal muscle, as in, in at rest, for example, now you're just sitting, okay, you're not doing too much, uh, uh, too much physical movement. In these situations, skeletal muscle will be mostly using fatty acids. Okay, so at low uh, intensities of exercise, skeletal muscle will be mostly using uh, fatty acids by means of oxidative phosphorylation. Yeah, so it's an oxidative metabolism of fatty acids. As the intensity of exercise increases, more and more glucose will be used for the production of ATP. And by the time we get to about 80% of maximum exertion, of maximum load, we get to almost 100% glucose. Okay? So the main two substrates, energy substrates for skeletal muscle are at low exercise levels, at low exertion levels, fatty acids, at high ones, we get almost 100% glucose. For the cardiac muscle, that's different. Cardiac muscle mostly uses fatty acids. Okay? It can use lactate and uses lactate at some point, okay, in some situations. So we, we do get, basically, the heart cannot really do glycolysis, okay, the cardiac muscle. I mean, anaerobic glycolysis, it's not gonna really do that. Okay? So we can't really produce lactate for a very long time. So the heart is really almost always aerobically respiring on fatty acids or lactate or glycerol or some other things. Okay? For smooth muscle, smooth muscle also is mostly oxidative. Okay? So in most situations it will be using fatty acids. It can use glucose, but it really depends on the specific situation. But mostly it's going to be fatty acids. Okay? So especially, I don't think it's a surprise that cardiac muscle is oxidative and uses fatty acids, but it might be a bit of a surprise that skeletal muscle really is not, under normal conditions, under low exertion stress, it's not really using a lot of glucose. Okay? It's mostly running on fatty acids. But again, the energy metabolism, the substrate metabolism of especially skeletal muscle will cover in a lot more detail next year when we talk about all the different, uh, all the different regulations and how, how that works. All right, questions? No questions, I'll take it that you understand everything and you remember everything forever. All right, okay, thanks. Thank